Christmas is a special time, a time of rejoicing, a time of thanksgiving, of gift giving, of feasting, and of being together with family and friends. And Christmas is a time for special music. What better way to celebrate the birthday of Jesus than to join together and raise our voices in the special songs of Christmas. The sounds of Christmas have been with us a while now. All of us have, have them stored in our memories. As children, we strained to hear Santa and the reindeer on the rooftops. As we get older, the sounds may now include the voice of grandparents, parents, or others who are no longer with us. But no matter the sounds we remember, there is one constant that is universal, that of Christmas songs and carols. Martin Luther said this about music, next to the word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in the world. This precious gift has been given to us that we might thereby remind ourselves that God has created us for the express purpose of praising and extolling God. Nowhere is this more true than at Christmas, when all the world sings the mystery of Emmanuel, God with us, in more languages and styles than we can name. We hear it in the voices of little children singing for the first time, and in nursing homes from the mouths of people who have forgotten so much, but can still sing joy to the world. In every land and in every generation, we sing out the story that Christ is born to save. We briefly glimpse hope and tentatively add our voices to the chorus of peace on earth, goodwill to all. This morning, we will share a brief story before each carol we sing. Please stand for our call to worship. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And we have beheld God's glory. The word was made flesh and lived among us. In the word was life, and the life was the light of all people. Come thou long expected Jesus. Charles Wesley was a man who composed more than 7,000 hymns, scores of which are still sung today in churches across the world, including our own church. He was born on December 18, 1707, the 18th child of Samuel and Susanna Wesley. Charles was given the best education available in England and finished college determined to become a minister. After a failed mission to the new colony of Georgia in America, Wesley returned to England, where he had a severe attack of pleurisy, which confined him to a bed for months. At the end of his sickness, he wrote, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, which launched the career of the world's most renowned composer of hymns. Over the course of the next few years, Wesley wrote such hymn classics as Christ the Lord is Risen Today, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Wesley wrote, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, around the age of 40. And though this hymn dealt with the birth of Jesus, the composer was actually inspired by Haggai, second chapter, seventh verse. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Published in 1744, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus was sung to several different melodies before most hymnals finally assigned the lyrics to a tune known as Heifredal, which we sing today. Let us find our rest in Thee. Yeah. 
is real strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have filled us with the new light of the word who became flesh and lived among us. Let the light of our faith shine in all we do. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The First Noel The First Noel is one of the few surviving early Christmas standards that is a genuine folk song. When it was written, there were very few Bibles in circulation. Most were either in churches or monasteries and were written in Latin. Common people rarely saw a Bible in person, and even if they would have, they probably wouldn't have been able to read the words in the sacred book since most people living in those times were illiterate. This is probably the case with the composer of the first Noel. With no Bible ready to guide his person, the writer drew from the stories he or she had been told about the events of Christ's birth. The writer mostly recounted the stories accurately, but they aired when depicting the shepherds following the star to Christ's birthplace. The Bible does not mention the star with the shepherds, only with the Magi. For the first 300 years of its existence, the first Noel, like other carols, was not part of religious services. Because the clergy disdained carols like the first Noel, these songs truly became the holiday voice of the people. They related the joy of Christmas, the wonder of God sending a son to save every man and woman, no matter what their station in life. The songs became part of family tradition. Many of the holiday's most beloved songs would have been lost if common folk had not passed them down from generation to generation. The first Noel was published by William Sandy in 1833. He was a lawyer who loved music and spent his spare time collecting both French and English folk songs. Already a favorite with the peasant class, by the mid-1800s, when the Church of England began using new songs during their services, the first Noel found universal acclaim.
from John, the first chapter. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and the life brought light to, the, to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. The story of Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels We Have Heard on High is a song steeped in great mystery. Unlike other carols whose writers are unknown, but whose origins can be clearly traced to a certain time or certain place, this song seemingly appeared out of the air. Because the first people to sing this carol lived in 19th century France, many believe that it must have originated there. In fact, most sources today call it a French carol, yet even that assumption is often called into question by historians. What can be stated with absolute certainty is that this Christmas song must have been penned by a person who had professional knowledge of the Bible and an incredible gift for taking scripture and reshaping it into verse. This fact, combined with the use of Latin in the song's chorus, seems to indicate that a monk or a priest from the Catholic Church was more than likely responsible for writing Angels We Have Heard on High. This carol was first published in 1855 in a French songbook, but records indicate that the song had been used in church masses for more than 50 years before that publication. Except for the verses translated into languages other than French today, the song is sung just as it was 150 years ago. Yet for maybe a thousand years or more before that, monks probably sang this same song as they celebrated the birth of the Savior. The song may well be as old as the church itself.
We invite you to take time to consider your offering. And we do have numerous ways that you can give offering today. You can mail in a check. You can go to the website, oursaviorslc.org, and click the giving link there. You can text GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 763-317-0750. Or you can sign up for automated giving by contacting Kim Freed at the church office. That is 763-434-6117. We thank you for your gifts. Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. Few people today realize the popular Christmas song, Beautiful Star of Bethlehem, was written by the late R. Fisher Boyce in a Middle Tennessee milk barn in the early part of the 20th century. It would go on to become a seasonal standard performed by a variety of artists, and it would eventually be sung in the White House by the Judds during a nationally televised Bob Hope Christmas special. R. Fisher Boyce and his wife, Cora Carleton, were parents of 11 children. Boyce wrote Beautiful Star of Bethlehem while the family was living on a dairy farm in Plainview, Tennessee. The songwriter's son, Franklin Boyce, recalled that his dad said he couldn't concentrate in the house because of the noise made by the children. He walked across the road to the barn to find solitude that he needed to write. My father said, this song was inspired by the Lord, otherwise how could he, a simple country man, ever write a song about such a glorious event in the world history? Franklin Boyce asked. In 1940, the Vaughn Company published Boyce's song, Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. Our Fisher Boyce was a deacon and a song leader at Mount Carmel Baptist Church when the song was written. Boyce and his wife Cora would sometimes sing the song at church He'd sing the lead part, and his wife would sing the harmony in her clear alto voice. Their daughter remembers that Cora would weep every time they sang the song together. She was very proud of her husband for writing Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. This song is a favorite of Our Savior's director of music, Jennifer Thurman. She remembers her grandmother singing Beautiful Star of Bethlehem every Christmas with the ladies' quartet at their Mennonite church in Iowa. We chose to include this song in this program this year, because the rare star of Bethlehem appeared in the night sky last week on December 21st. It happens when the two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, appear nearly aligned in the sky. The last time this happened was 1623 in Galileo's time. That kind of gives you a sense of the rarity of the event. Please enjoy this old Southern Gospel song and sing along if you know it. star of hope of light guiding the pilgrim through the night over the mountain till the break of dawn and into the light of perfect day it will give out a lovely ray beautiful star of Bethlehem Star of Bethlehem, 
Emmanuel, God with us. As you came to earth in the surprise of the baby, in the Bethlehem stable, come to us today in the gifts of wine and bread. Strengthen us with your sacrament of life so we may go and tell the story of your Christmas coming. Amen. For communion today, as you are celebrating at home, I am celebrating with you using a special communion set. This was given to me by my friend and mentor in ministry and uh, who had this commissioned. It's a beautiful stonework set. That's the, the plate and this is the cup that we'll be using for communion today. So you can prepare your communion elements in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We join together and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hear these words as you share communion with one another as you receive communion. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Receive the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace always. Amen. Let us pray. In the gift of your Son, you have given us the gift of life. Send us out with this story of your great love. Let the joy of this blessed meal empower us to go tell the story for the whole world to hear. Amen. It came upon a midnight clear, 
In 1849, a Unitarian minister named Dr. Edmund Sears from Wayland, Massachusetts, was writing a Christmas Eve message for his congregation. Though it would be another decade before a civil war tore the United States apart, the debate over slavery, compounded by the poverty he saw in his own community, had all but broken the man's spirit. He desperately searched for words to inspire his congregation, but he was having a problem lifting even his own spirit above the depressing scenes that surrounded him. In his community, Sears was a force of caring in a world that seemed to concern itself little with the traumas of the hungry or the sick. His burden for the helpless forced him to reach out each day to those Christ called the least of these. Yet as he worked on writing an uplifting Christmas message, it was the poverty and the hopelessness of the people he touched in the slums that sickened his heart and blocked his progress. He wrote a short sermon and decided to end his Christmas service with a new inspired five verse poem he quickly wrote. While the minister wanted his congregation to celebrate Christmas, he also wanted them to reach out to the poor, to address the nation's social ills, and to consider what they could do as individuals to best reflect the spirit of Christ in their daily lives. Since Sears was also a magazine and newspaper editor, in addition to being a preacher, he published his new poem called It Came Upon a Midnight Clear in the December 29th, 1849 issue of one of his publications. A composer named Richard Storrs Willis set it to music and American troops brought it to France during the First World War, making it world known. For homesick soldiers, his words seemed to voice their own prayers of peace on earth, as well as those penned by Edmund Sears a century before. first Christmas be sung in all you do. May the good news of Christ's birth fill you with joy, peace, and the promise of new beginnings in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Share the gift of Jesus. Thanks be to God. <laughs>